So don't worry, we're just gonna talk about all of the stalling techniques and how to get around a lot of the lies and what to do when somebody is vilifying you. And not only vilifying you to lawyers, or in our case, the media, but putting it in court papers so everybody can see it, right? We're gonna, we're gonna give you a little update. Right now I'm gonna, do we have, uh, is it ready? Okay, we're just gonna play a little video. Kind of shows you what we've been up to for the last six years. Uh, some of this video took place before my dad had died. And just what we were trying to do to see him. There we go. Ready? Awesome. What would you do? Can we hit the lights? If somebody took the most important person in your life away from you. Maybe not. This is what I did. Casey Kasem wants to see his children. It's a human right. Should be in the state? Just no, like, no, 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 no. Really? Casey Kasem, iconic DJ, pioneering broadcaster, the voice of American radio, spent his final days silenced by Louis body dementia and caught in a family feud between the children from his first marriage, Carrie, Julie, and Mike, and his second wife, Jean Kasem. The children worried about the care he was getting and the fact that Jean kept moving him around. Finally, Jean stopped letting the children visit their father altogether. Nasty public confrontations followed. Shame on these children, shame. And after Jean pulled Casey out of the hospital at 2.30 in the morning against doctor's orders, Carrie was granted temporary guardianship of her dad. Casey spent his final days suffering with severe bed sores and his life ended on Father's Day, June 15th. I think I have a little authority to speak on what happened to my dad and to basically say that I think it's a shame the way the elderly is treated in this country at times. And I hope my, my dad's case can start a national conversation on elder abuse. We know what happened. And if you've seen the evidence, if you've seen what we've seen, uh, you would understand completely, absolutely, why we are here. My dad was always there for us, no matter how busy he was. I remember one time, I think it was third grade, I was having such a hard time in school. And even though he was at the height of his career, he came every single recess and he would check to see if I turned my homework in. Take the person that you love most on earth. Know that they're sick, know they want to see you. You get 20 minutes with them before being ripped away by an armed guard and, at, and having them say, please stay and you can't. It's not just us though, it's his brother, it's his cousins, it's his best friends. Everybody has been blocked from seeing my father. I had a very close relationship with my father, saw him every single week, talked to him, until he lost his voice every day on the phone. And we were cut off for no reason at all last July. This isn't just happening to me and my father is gravely ill. And if this bill passes, it may not even affect me that it will affect all these people that when I went public, wrote me letter after letter after letter after letter, emails, Facebook, so many people wrote me saying, I'm in the same situation, please help me. I don't have a conservatorship. I don't have a durable power of attorney. I don't have any money. I don't know what to do. If this bill had been in place, my dad would still be alive today. I know that I had to change some things here. I'm turning something that is my darkest hour into something hopeful and something my dad would do. Elder abuse is no different than child abuse. Abuse is abuse. What would Casey, your dad, say about you fighting for him today? I think he'd be very proud of me. I think he'd be very proud. Yeah. My name's Casey Kasem, reminding you to keep your feet in the ground and keep reaching for the stars. Ask you to stand for yourself, stand for your family, so you can stand for others.
Thank you. Sometimes when I hear my dad's voice, I tear up. Do you do that too? God. I, I've seen that video a hundred times or more, and I'm still get, I still get teary -eyed. Um So we've been doing a lot with Case and Cares. We've passed the 12 bills in 12 states, 13 bills in 12 states. Now we have two bills in Illinois. Uh, nine other states have adopted uh, legislation. We're doing everything we can to give adult children visitation rights to help curb guardianship abuse, to do what we can, but more bills need to be passed. They really do, and we need your help. We need your help, whether it's you with boots on the ground coming to testify, writing your legislators, donating to Case and Cares, donating to SEER, donating to people like us that are doing something about it. It's not cheap. <laughs> um, but whatever you can do, we need your help. Ours was a case that was all over the media. We got attention. People loved my dad. People listened to him every single weekend. He was shaggy on Scooby-Doo. <laughs> yeah? 350 cartoon voices. He was well-loved and well-liked, and so we got the attention, and we had a platform. Most people going through this don't have a famous last name and don't even have enough money to hire a lawyer. Most people don't ever end up seeing their family again. They can call us. We can do what we can to help. I've gotten on the phone myself with people that are holding mom or dad hostage, saying, I'm doing a documentary. I've just interviewed the entire family who has been isolated from mom or dad. What, we, we'd like to interview you. Oh, no, that's not happening. No, 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 no. And I've gotten visitation that way, just simply with a phone call. But it doesn't always work that way. And like I said yesterday, Kathleen Braun uh, the CEO of Case and Cares has actually paid for people to get a lawyer to go in to see their mom or dad. So we do what we can. So today, uh, my, I want my sister to talk a little bit about her experience, and we'll give you an update on what's going on. There's some, it's funny because people say, well, it's, it's not, you know, they, we joke about it because it's been going on for five years, and there's some crazy stuff that has happened that you either, it can either cave you in, and it's like, she said that? She said that about us? Or you go, okay, hold on, this is so ridiculous. We're dog killers now? <laughs> We've killed your dog and hung it on your porch? Um, I mean, literally stuff like that that's in the, the, the papers that she has sent to the court. Oh, it's, it gets worse. Um, we're, we're also shooting guns off in her phone when we call. But there's no police reports, there's no recordings, there's no, yeah. So, but I'm gonna let my sister talk a little bit and then we're gonna read some, some stuff to you that, well, I'll, I'll, I'll let, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it for you to announce that. Hi, so, um, the, uh, so I'm a physician assistant. I'm not working currently, but I was trained in palliative care and hospice. And so everything that the doctor was saying was so true and in fact, one of the reasons in 2007 we had a long discussion with my dad about end-of-life care is when he was diagnosed with what was presumed to be uh, Parkinson's disease. And I worked at the Veterans Hospital with end-of-life care, and there were so many family discussions and arguments and disagreements about what we were going to do with this loved one at the end of life, even when there was an advanced directive right there that the patient had filled out when they had capacity and the family members now are crying and they don't want to see their loved one go and so it's there were so many ongoing discussions so I my husband's a physician as well and I came home spoke with him and I said my gosh this is exactly what's going to happen with my dad is God forbid when if the Parkinson's progresses which it usually does it gets to the point where he's unable to make decisions this is gonna be our family. And so we spoke with my dad about that. And we basically said, Dad, you know, have you made your wishes known? And have you, you know, made your wishes known about who you would like to care for you at the end of your life? And he never took a pill without running it by my husband. I mean, it was always like, is this the right thing to take? Is this the right thing to take? And you know, when you have a physician in the family, it's sometimes you do that. And so he had expressed to us that he would like myself and my husband to be the one to make these decisions. Well, 
we knew that wasn't going to be okay with his wife, and that was a whole other debate. And we did not need to be his decision makers, but we also wanted to be involved in that process. And we knew that wasn't going to happen with his wife. So we said, well, Dad, you need to put this in writing, what you want at the end of your life, what your wishes are, who you want to make those decisions for you. And so he said, you know, I'd like for, you know, you and Jamil to be the decision makers. And we said, it has to be in writing. It has to be notarized. So he said, okay, but you can't show this to my wife. He's like, I will be run through the mill if this happens, you know? And we said, we understand. Yeah, we just... Oh, hello. There we go. He actually said at one point, I'm battered. Yeah. That was, that was his exact I mean, he, words. He, yeah, it was so it was it's just one of these things where I think he just got to the point in his life where he wasn't gonna go up against the devil, you know? You're gonna lose, unfortunately. So 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 he said yes, I, so we went and we had this durable power of attorney signed and this advanced health care directive signed and notarized and he said keep it do not use it unless you absolutely have to that was 2007 i mean we knew what was coming 2013 rolls around and she has completely stopped us from seeing our father i mean like literally out of nowhere and people will go well what did you do like something had to happen she's not just gonna do that Yes, she is. That's why we had it in 2007, had it signed, because we knew this was going to happen. There are people out there, and this is sort of my segue into what we're going to talk about today, that are extremely manipulative, that are extremely evil, and, and are extremely charming all at the same time. So they will charm the doctors, which she did many times over. The, the doctors thought she was great. Oh, she's so attentive. She's so caring. I mean, it could not have been farther from the truth. It's not their fault. It's just these, there's some people out there that are, that are like this. And these are the people I think that we've all dealt with, you know, and, and they're, they're, they're really, really good at what they do. So, um, so anyway, we had the storm of signed. She stops letting us see him. We had no legal recourse because there was no law in California that's, that allowed visitation for adult children or family members. So it's all up to the spouse. If the spouse says, no, I don't want you to come into the hospital room, you're not going into the hospital room. It's simple as that. Well, for us, it was simple as, we just want to see our dad every Sunday. That's like, that's our thing. He comes over, he sees my children, we have lunch, it's a wonderful time. Anyway, that completely stopped. We go to the courts, the judge said, I can't rule on this. There's no, I don't have jurisdiction over this. There's no law in place that allows me to rule on this. You guys have sophisticated attorneys. This is literally what she said. You guys have sophisticated attorneys. Go figure it out. And it's like, her hands were tied. And I was like, well, that's why we're in the courtroom. Because we have one, she's not, she's irrational. So then, of course, what we did is I said to the lawyers, well, we do have this 2007 durable power of attorney that my dad signed and signed over, you know, durable power of attorney to us. And so we brought that to court. And so that was our only legal recourse. And, you know, then of course she, in two, this is kind of like, I think what someone was saying, she had another one from 2011. So she's like, well, ha, look what I have. And we're like, but in 2011, did he have capacity? And so it was this whole fight in the court system. And speaking of which, was costing thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars of legal fees, and it was just, it was insane. And then finally she said, oh, no, no, we don't need to do this anymore. I, you know, we'll sign a visitation agreement. And I said, that's all we want. We don't need to be as medical decision makers. We were using this for ex this exact reason. We just want to see our dad. Of course, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, we come up with this horrible visitation agreement, which treats my dad like a prisoner, whatever. Well, she never honored it. So... Ever. So the point is, is there are people out there that are really manipulative. They're going to fool their own attorneys. They're going to fool the healthcare care uh, clinicians. They're going to fool law enforcement because th they are that good at manipulating. So now here we are four and a half years later into this lawsuit. We are now in a civil trial because the DA didn't prosecute criminally, which is blows my mind if you guys knew half the stuff that went on. But we're in a civil suit because we want to hold her accountable. Well, for, oh, yay. <laughs> She's the one, I'm, I'm the passive one. She's the one that made this all happen. 
<laughs> but the point is, it's four and a half years later, we still haven't gone to trial. So what we are, what the whole point of this talk today is not to tell you everything that happened to my dad. I feel like we've been there, done that. But to talk about and to try and give you guys some um, so support to keep going and to keep fighting because she's been able to stall this case with so many different things and ways and going around the legal system and the loopholes and we had a trial date for May. Well, that got postponed. Now we have a trial date for June 3rd that's currently being postponed because she appealed this one decision and da da da. It's like the point is you have to be persistent because these people will not stop. I mean, they just go and go and find new avenues and they torture you and they torture the loved one in the meantime and, and they've drained so many resources with law enforcement and with the court system. It's just insane. So we want to kind of share with you some of the craziness because that's probably the most entertaining to be quite frank. <laughs> <laughs> and then just to kind of you know, explain why, you know, how to keep going and, and just, frankly, just to keep going despite all the craziness. So, yeah. basically, uh, do you want to? No, I just, oh, wait, am I turning off? Well, the let's. Mic? Go ahead, go ahead. So, okay, go ahead, you go ahead. Right, well. What I wanted to say, too, is we didn't stop even though she kept coming after us, even though there were horrible lies being told. So oh, sorry, really quickly. One, another thing is when we were going through this lawsuit, my husband and I, because we were named as Durable Power Attorneys for Healthcare, we were sort of in the, the first lawsuit back in 2013 where she eventually settled. Her lawyer came to our lawyer and said, if you don't sign this visitation agreement, Jean is going to write in the court papers, which by the way, you can write whatever you want in those court right. papers and make up any accusations about anybody and then they get submitted in their public knowledge. Jean is going to write in the court papers that your husband, my husband is a physician at UCLA, he's the director of his program, he's world renowned in his field. I mean, it's like, so this would, this could damage his career, right? He's going to write that your husband, like, tried to kill my dad by giving him this medication, like, just these outlandish lies, and now my poor husband's being dragged into this. So, I mean, it was just, it, these smear tactics, and I'm going to be honest, it worked. I was like, this is where I draw the line. Like, and I'm this is where I said, Julie, you go out and you tell the public exactly what's happening. And I you said, go out and she wouldn't do it. Well, because, right, when they Google my husband's name, what's going to come up is all the BS that she but said. But you, so. you get out ahead of it. That's all. But and anyway, I understand. So, yeah. so they do these horrible, crazy things. <laughs> and so... If you don't have a carry on your team, you're going to succumb and you're never going to see your loved one again. But I have to say, doing this for five years and working with families, there's always one fighter. And then you have the support of the passive ones, you know? But they don't want to do with any of the frontline stuff. It's like the Marines and the Navy, I guess, right? <laughs> you got your backup support, but you have to have your front line. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's right. So, so, yeah, um, I, <laughs> so, so again, we're just talking about like getting back to sort of our topic is the tactics they use to intimidate you. One is to go to the media and make up crazy lies that could ruin your family, ruin your career. They make up lies in the court, in these court papers. For instance, the most recent thing is, so we're suing um, her for wrongful death intentional infliction of emotional distress. So myself, my sister, my brother, and my uncle, my dad's brother, they were best friends. Uh, sh because she didn't let us see him, it, it was horrible. It was just so horrible when you know that your father is ill, especially, I mean, not even especially. I mean, just being in the field I'm in, that's what I did. I took care of those that were dying and those that were terminally ill. And not to be able to not be there with for my father was like just heart-wrenching. Uh, we're suing her for elder abuse, intentional infliction of emotional distress, wrongful death, and breach of contract because she never let us see our dad after we signed that contract. So now she, three years later, throws a countersuit to us mm -hmm. saying that... No, no, she throws it on us the absolutely last day she could. It was the day my dad died, June. so June 15th, 2018, it was 18, 18, four years later. Literally four years after he died. She throws a suit on us after we've had this suit going for years. Saying that we conspired with this durable power attorney from 2007. With the attorneys, with the doctors. To, yeah, the attorneys, the doctors, the doctors are in us. And the PPB attorney, sorry, the, oh, the yeah. court appointed attorney that we didn't know or she didn't know. 
He's in on it now too. So and she's we have this it. homicidal guardianship scam to kill our dad and like take his estate and we weren't even like th th the estate had nothing to do with it. We were just trying to s literally just trying to see our dad. So in that, that's her lawsuit against us. So right, that's now in the in the media. Any media can go look through that and pick that up. But then on top of it, she puts things in there that her, she and her daughter were so fearful of us because we in December of 2013 killed her dog the family dog, put it in a bag and hung it on her front door. That's in the court paper, so TMZ can pick that up. Anybody can pick that up. Yeah. She said that we called them repeatedly and shot guns through the phone to intimidate them. I mean, it's like- We rammed our car in her gate. We rammed our car in her gate. But there's nothing wrong with the gate. But there's no photographic evidence. They have video, no video everywhere. But there's yeah. like nothing to, so it's like these kinds of things that they will do to shut you down and to scare you and it's just, it's crazy. But the lawyer roars loud, very, very, very loud. And once you get past that, yeah. you can pet their heads and say, okay, sit down, sit down. Most people though with the roar, and at the, the onset, they back off. That's if the you last know, thing you do. You do not back off. You keep going and you expose, and you expose, and you expose. I mean, I think as if you know truth is on your side, like yep. literally, there is nothing she said that's truthful. So we're just like, okay, just bring it. Okay, we killed your dog. Okay, what's next? Like, yeah, come we on. Just, and and anything on your side, again. like, let's just, just, you have to keep going. You just have to. It gets more and more ridiculous because she throws up lies, they don't stick, she comes up with something new. Yeah. I mean, it was, well, we're taking Casey on a vacation against medical orders, against doctor's orders, against, we're taking him on a vacation. That next it was, we're taking him up to Washington to see an expert, because there's no experts in Los Angeles, supposedly. Um, every time her story changed, it kept changing, kept changing with us. How much money that she said we owed them. Uh, what we had done, I mean, that we, uh, the, well, the worst lie was we hadn't talked to our dad in 10 years and we had. We were estranged. From was, yeah, yeah, we had like video I mean, and just, picture evidence. But we from, still, we're going to show it all in court. From the week he, that he was taken from us. Like every week we took pictures, we had his friends over, they took pictures. We have, we had to prove we are good kids. We had to prove we loved our dad. And I think that was, that's why Carrie, one of the reasons she started the Case from Cares Foundation was because it's this thing where we had to go to court Instead of, instead of the court saying, you are his blood children, you have every right to see him. No, we had to prove in the courts that we had a good relationship with our dad. It should be the opposite. It's she, she should have to prove why we shouldn't see our dad. That's right. So and we should be able to see him until she's proven that we can't. And but it's not that way. It's is admissible. Around. Sorry, we're talking over to this terrible. We gotta stop. <laughs> um, but let's, let's yeah, yeah, hearsay is admissible. Uh, in it, it's the only time I've ever seen that in court, where somebody, a guardian, a, somebody with power of attorney, a second wife, a, a, another child, can come in and vilify all the loved ones, and it's taken like it's truth. They don't ever say, "Well, well, is there any proof of that? Do you do you have any uh, any emails? Do you have a, a police report? Is there anything like never? You don't ever hear this." Um, I just, I wasn't going to do this, but I have to. What, Jean's on her um, 16th set of lawyers. From the civil suit. From the civil and the probate, both. both. The probate. So Marshall Grossman, Amy McAvoy, Steve Haney, Michael Saroy, Craig Marcus. Craig Marcus uh, was crying in court, begging the judge to let him go from the case. <laughs> because she was threatening his family. his family. Sandy Passman, he left. Trevor Large, oh, Trevor Large, we have something from Trevor Large that we're gonna share with you in a minute. Becky James, Joel Paget, Tommy Davis, uh, Hilliard and Polsonelli, Robert Castleman, Gary Ruttenberg, and there's another Norway attorney, I couldn't remember his name. Um, so, I mean, these are, it's just, it goes on and on and on. These attorneys keep dropping her or she leaves them because they are not doing what she says to do. So here's something that just came out. I don't know if it, it didn't really get picked up by the media, but it literally just happened a couple weeks ago. Yes. Trevor Large uh, was Jean's attorney for the last year. And Which part do you we want could to do, this is good, right? There's so many. There's much. so many. Um, basically, we're just. We'll read a few of these things. But basically, Trevor Large had. Um, he was representing her in the civil suit against us. And he recently filed a declaration to, uh, for permission to withdraw from the case. And usually when an attorney does that, they, they 
write a declaration, they'd like to withdraw from the case, and then they go into the, the, with the judge into his private chambers and discuss why. It's usually not necessarily something that they share. But he wrote this whole declaration and then emailed it to our attorneys. It was a little gift he gave us. <laughs> yeah, so uh, this is what Trevor, Trevor said was in good faith. I believe in good, okay, here we go. In particular, defendants have A. No, 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 you gotta start here. Well, you, what? This is where it starts and that's That's it too long. It's too long. Go for it, you read that. Well, uh, uh, brief, they've, yeah. they've breached the terms of the fee agreement. It's been an ongoing problem since July of 2018. This was just filed last month. Um, I have informed my clients to find new counsel for the last two months. During that time, I've received repeated assurance that, quote, it's being taken care of and, quote, it's being handled. However, at this point, it is unfair to my firm and to my client to wait any longer. They have repeatedly refused or ignored my legal advice regarding strategy and insist on pursuing claims that I believe are not warranted. I refuse to continue arguing with my client over strategies that I believe are not in good faith. In particular, defendants have A, unreasonably refused to provide BFAS, that's the name of the firm, with complete copies of records relevant to their claims and defenses. B, refused to authorize BFAS to file pleadings and other documents uh, as drafted by counsel, insisting on laborious and often ill-advised changes which have the effect of substantially undercutting the professionalism of those documents, notably by requiring the introduction of objectionable, salacious, and or irrelevant claims. They have engaged in a pattern of delayed responsiveness that has thoroughly undermined BFAs, BFAS's effective res, re, my lord, representation and needlessly tax BFAS human resources and excessively completely unnecessary of the support, um, uh, support staff overtime. Uh, so basically, you know, you get the gist of what's going on there. So we just have to keep sort of fighting through this, and now she's gonna hire a new attorney that's gonna throw more slanderous claims until that attorney realizes, wait a minute, that she's not working with all of her marbles. And so it goes on and on and on. And so th this is the problem with, um, with law enforcement and, and lawyers and district attorneys. Not so much as your attorney, that's at a higher level, but with the people on the front line, so Adult Protective Services, they don't see this, right? Because this is just so evil, it's not transparent. So was my dad, when we called Adult Protective Services and we called the police, was my dad bleeding? No. Was he bruised? No. Was he well fed? Yes. Was he clean? Yes. Was he in a multi-million dollar house with 24 hour care? Yes. But they don't see this. And so it's like when they, when they get the call from us, they're like, oh gosh, you know, there's a bunch of rich, spoiled children or, you know, family. This is a family dispute. We're not going to get involved. I urge you, if you are on the front lines, to dig deeper. And I don't know how legally to do that, but I just know that if you're getting a call, there's a reason. There is always a reason. And it's, it's, it goes past the bleeding and the bruising and soiling of the diaper and being neglected. It goes way past that. And isolation alone is a crime. So her isolating him from us, it was a crime. But I, either law enforcement just didn't see that, they, they just didn't have the resources to dig deeper, I don't know what it is, but if you are on the front lines, please take these calls seriously. And there are a few uh, detectives in here that deal with elder abuse. Will you raise your hands? Right. Look at this. Yes. Hey. Thank you. Thank you. Here is one, one, uh, something else that Trevor Large put in very public court papers. As discussed above, there has been a serious breakdown in the attorney-client relationship. Defendants have made requests as of BFASs that are inadvisable at best and borderline unethical at worst. Yeah. Yeah, you don't really say that in public about your clients. I'm glad he did. I'm glad that people are saying, you know, hey, wait a second, this has got to stop. We're not going to put this salacious, these salacious lies in court papers so you can feel good about it. We're going to stop Yeah, and I'm this. glad that he's not just collecting a paycheck, yeah. you know, and well, going he's not on. collecting a paycheck. Well, he wasn't getting paid yeah. anyway, but. She's been sued by. <laughs> that's true. By several attorneys. <laughs> um, so I think that's <laughs> sort of the update. You know, I mean, yeah. we could be here all day, but yeah. the, uh, the idea is that just, 
Oh, and here's a good one. Oh. Okay, so when she did put the lawsuit against, uh, it was me, my sister, my brother, and my attorney, Troy Martin, who's actually on his way, just texted me. Um, my attorney, Troy Martin, uh, she also sued the hospital my dad was at in, in Washington. Where he, where he died. Where he died. Um, oh, really quickly, side note. So in that um, video you showed about a good death, my dad, after suffering under the hands of his wife, we finally, my sister was able to get medical power of attorney over his care, and we took him directly from where he was under her care to a hospital, directly from the ambulance to the hospital. Three days later, the doctors were, the, he was in the ICU, the doctors said, you know, there's nothing more we can do, we need to put him on, you know, anything we do is futile, and so, la la la, long story short. I wouldn't hear it, by the way. I said, no, 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 no said, you're going to save him. There, I literally couldn't hear it. Yeah. And I, I said, what are you talking about? You, he doesn't need water or, or food. Well, his G-tube is backing up. He's not digesting anymore. His organs are shutting down. He's dying. I said, what are you talking about? And I remember any kind of liquid they would give him, he'd start, he, he was choking to death. And they took him off of hydration, and he started to get better. I'm like, look, he's getting better. He's getting better. And I said, put him back on hydration. I do not want my dad to be thirsty. And they did it, and he started to die. He started, he started drowning. drowning in his own. The, the and I said, I get it, I get it, I get it, I get it, I get it. And then we hear that Jean and her daughter have gone back to Los Angeles. They didn't stay where they took him in Washington with a court order to be up in that room with us. They didn't stay with their dying father or husband. They went back down and got a court order saying you've got to put him back on hydration and nutrition because they weren't there to understand it. And they told the media that we had unplugged our dad for money. Wow. So we're going through this, and this is on the news. Meanwhile, though, so when it got to the point that we had to put him on comfort measures, it was one of the hardest decisions, as you can imagine, you have to make for a family member. It was hor horrifying. Yeah. But we did, and then he died... Uh, he actually hung on for like another two weeks. two weeks. He died early in the morning on Father's Day, which happened to also be National Elder Abuse Awareness Day. Yep. Two weeks later. Yep. Speaking of a good death, I was there, my sister was there, my brother was there, my uncle was there, my aunt was there, and my dad's like best friend slash uh, right hand man. Right hand man for the last you know 30 years. And it looked a little bit like that. We were all around him. We were all touching him. And we were all just there with him. And it was, uh, it was, thank God, a good death. Because we otherwise would never have seen him and we would never have known if he died or lived or where he was buried, just like, you know, she had said, the lady. Yeah. So, you know, I was going to read this. So she, so she right. sued the hospital that they killed him. And, of course, that case was dismissed very quickly. And then our case was dismissed as well when she tried to put it up there. And this is what the police actually came out and said. It said, the administrative investigation released this week by Gig Harbor Police found that Casey Kasem received appropriate care and that any medical decisions were made by family authorized to act on his behalf. Quote, there was no evidence of collusion between the family members and doctors that would construe any part of this incident to be considered a homicide, the department said in a statement. So, you know, that was, thank you. Well, I mean, it's just wasting more resources again. I mean, she's just, she tried to hit us up there by filing this lawsuit, didn't work. She's trying to hit us down here. She went to 48 hours and was like, there. you know, she's just, she's just, she's trying to win in the court of public opinion She's not even winning there because she knows she's not going to win in the court of law.